Good morning, good afternoon, and indeed good evening to our global audience and a truly warm welcome to you all. I'm Arun Batra, pronouns he, him, his, your host uh, for this session and also a global DEI leader here at SNAP. I'm totally privileged to be hosting a question and answer session with my esteemed panel, whom I'll introduce in a moment. And what I will say is I want this session to be as interactive and as free flowing as possible. So please feel free to post questions in the chat and I'll try and ask the panelists your questions. And in addition, I know some of you have already sent in questions, which I've tried to include in the order uh, of the questions that I'm going to ask to my panel. In the unlikely event that you were not aware of what this session is about, well, it's all about how to model and incentivize inclusive leadership, which is a core component of the Action to Catalyze uh, Tech Report, which I know many of you have heard about uh, this morning uh, and throughout the session so far. So without further ado, let me introduce you to my esteemed panel. First of all, we have Evan Spiegel, as well as being my boss. He's the co-founder and CEO of Snap. Uh, and we are a tech company that empowers people to express themselves, live in the moment, learn about the world, and have fantastic fun together. Evan and Snap's other co-founder, Bobby Murphy, created Snap uh, while at Stanford University. And today, Snap is publicly traded a uh, company with around 363 million and I'm rising daily active users uh, around the world. In 2017, Evan formed the Spiegel Family Fund, which is committed to philanthropy in California and beyond. And through a dedication to the arts and education, housing and human rights, the fund supports multiple organizations that contribute to human progress. And Evan finally also sits on the boards of KKR uh, and the Berg Gruen Institute, and he's a member of the Business Roundtable and the Business Council. And then we have Jeffrey Williams, who's not my boss, but uh, indeed is a former client from my EY days. And I worked with him when he was the global head of DNI at both Thomson Reuters and uh, Dr. Martins. And Jeffrey, it's a delight to have you with us here today. Jeffrey has had a super diverse career journey, which started in the entertainment industry, working with artists signed to the Def Jam label and DreamWork Records, and then moved into healthcare, transport, and uh, media. Um, he's got many accolades. I'll just name a couple. Um, he was featured in the Financial Times 100 Ethnic Minority Role Models and also the Diversity in Marketing Media 50 Male Advocates for Equality. And there's another cool one here. In 2020, he was also named on the Global Diversity List um, among a couple of my heroes. That's the US VP Kamala Harris and um, the New Zealand Prime Minister um, Jacinda Ardern. And last but certainly not least, we have Oriel Patrick. And Oriel is the Chief Communications Officer at Aerial Investments, a global investment firm which at the end of 2021 had 18.3 billion in assets under management. She sits on the Operating Committee and leads an integrated team that handles all communications for the firm and its private equity subsidiary, which is Aerial Alternatives. And in her spare time, She's an investor in two early stage companies, and she's also the founding member of Chief. So what a fabulous panel, and I'm so uh, looking forward to hosting this with you all. So I'm gonna dive straight in, and Jeffrey, if you don't mind, I'm gonna go to question one directly to you. So we are all acutely aware uh, that the murder of George Floyd in 2020 shined a bright spotlight on societal and corporate failures. And we saw this incredible outpouring of emotion, followed by a number of promises made by corporate leaders. However, and there is a big however, there's a lot of press out there highlighting the disparities between the commitments that were made and the implementation of them. So Jeffrey, a simple question. Was this simply a moment rather than a movement? So um, I think it was a bit of both. Um, I think there was, the opportunity for people to move and to get to understand uh, what happened in the world and what was going on in the world and how people of colour, um, especially black people, were experiencing the world of work, but also the societal kind of implications of the systems that we live within. And I think one of the things that I had to, to look at and kind of get my head around was how do we drive accountability within organisations? And it was that piece of how do we unpick that piece of we can come up with lots of ideas of what we're going to do, but if we're not accountable and if we don't actually put some kind of mission or narrative behind it, it will all just kind of be that moment of us talking. So it's that piece of, I think, of when I look at the organisations that I've worked for and I'm and currently working with, it's that piece of kind of really setting the narrative of 
where are we going, why we're doing it, and how do we take our leaders on that journey and getting them to a place where they actually define their mission and their commitment behind it. And I think a lot of the time we kind of get into a place where we're looking at it from a standpoint of the big business, but individually we're not looking at it from a leadership standpoint. And it's the work of how do we do that. I think at Burberry, you know, you know it doesn't sit within uh, – a kind of people strategy, it's kind of the wider organizational agenda to try to drive this conversation. And I think that's been the opportunity to kind of broaden where DNI sits and making sure that it's a part of the culture, the part of the way that you do business. It's not just this thing that sits on the side of someone's desk. So I think the movement has kind of created the moment to have the conversation to, to move us forward. And I think it's that piece of now organizations are now kind of really getting the teeth around it and moving beyond just the shock and the, I guess, the trauma that sat within the moment. So if I can interpret what you said, Jeffrey, I think we're, I think it's probably fair to say we're on a bit of a journey. Most um, definitely. So, Oriel, Aaron Investments had committed uh, on the back of the murder to tackling economic inequality uh, in the US and trying to cro- close the racial wealth gap. So, direct question, how's that going? And, and is it progressing as you would have hoped it would have done? First of all, thank you for having me. I would say um, we were the ones watching what everyone else was doing after the murder. We've actually been doing this for 40 years. So Ariel is the oldest Black-owned investment management firm in the United States. Um, And for the past 40 years, before ESG was a funky acronym that people love to slap on their annual reports, um, it was a really big part of how we live and breathe. you know, just for example, we can point to about 50 to 60 times when we've urged uh, portfolio companies of ours, publicly traded companies, and it successfully helped them place Black or Latinx um, members of their boards. The list goes on and on. Um, so this is really a, a steady state. But in terms of how we've taken the conversation forward since uh, the tragic murder of George Floyd, I think a big part of what we're trying to call attention to is the fact that diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging conversations have been largely one-dimensional. So like Jeffrey said, you'll often find chief diversity officers sitting within HR. That signals in a very um, clear way that an institution only looks at diversity as a people-oriented or human capital-oriented initiative, when in fact it actually should be a strategic imperative throughout what we call the three Ps, people purchasing, meaning, you know, procurement and you know supply chain and philanthropy. And so it's difficult if you put someone in a role like that to really have them oversee and really galvanize an entire management team around all of these things. The last thing I'll say is that you know diversity of course is still one of the only areas um, of a, a CEO's remit where um, the same level of rigor around measurement and tracking is not required. So, you know, historically, if if a CEO were to hop on an earnings call and say, hey, hey we missed our target, but um, we'll try better next time, they would lose their job. But, you know, diversity is still one of the only areas where that um, is still excusable. So I think what we're really looking for is um, companies to really treat DEI the way that they would any other strategic imperative with data, tracking, measurement, reporting, um, and really as as much clarity, uniformity, and and specificity as possible. Um, And I'll talk more about our framework for that and how we work through that, but um, we'll punt it back to you, Arun. No, thank you so much. And look, uh, strategic impact, we've heard a lot about that already this morning. And being a consultant for a number of years, I certainly have got to love a framework uh, and data, and we'll pick more uh, upon that uh, later. So, look, moving us on, I've had a question in for, about the macroeconomic conditions we face, and this follows a similar theme. So, I'm I'm going to ask it because I think it's important. Um, and Evan, I'm I'm going to direct this uh, to you. So, a, a number of businesses right across the globe have, over the last two years, faced a number of external market headwinds, which has meant um, having to reduce headcount ambitions, or in some cases, even having to let people go. And many in the world of DEI have argued that when these pressures bear upon us, um, DEI ambitions fall by the wayside. So as Snap CEO, we've also faced his headwinds. Um, and I know this is something you care about deeply. So do you think DEI is at risk of becoming much less of a priority when we face these external pressures? 
Well, I think first and foremost, uh, you know, for, for our business, we really see DI as critical to innovation. And what we find, you know, constantly is that people from different backgrounds with different ways of thinking and communicating and participating in our business bring new ideas to the table. And in a time like this, where there are, you know, really significant uh, macroeconomic pressures, of course, that, that we're dealing with, but also uh, many other businesses, innovation becomes even more important as a differentiator and as a way of continuing to grow in, in such adverse uh, circumstances. So I, I think, you know, if anything, um, you know, it's, it's really putting more awareness and more focus on uh, DEI. And we're also trying to, you know, find the opportunities in these challenges. So as you mentioned, um, you know, we've had to reduce the size of our team. We've really slowed down our hiring, but that actually means we have more time to source more candidates because what we find, you know, historically, historically is that people who are only hiring from their friend group or connections they already have, they can sometimes miss out on talent that they wouldn't know uh, otherwise. And so if we can invest more in sourcing from uh, you know, a diverse uh, background of candidates you know, around the world, then we have a better shot at bringing more diverse team members into our business. And so, you know, uh, of course, it's, it's a critical moment right now in terms of our need to, to innovate, th to overcome these challenges, but we also are seeing some opportunities in our reduced uh, rate of hiring uh, to, to actually, um, you know, improve our sourcing, for example, of more diverse candidates. And then lastly, I would say something we should always keep an eye on is, is that I do think fear can be the enemy of progress. I think we've seen that consistently in, in our society. And, and so I'm worried at, at this moment right now when people are fearful for their job, they're, you know, fearful about the economy, they're fearful about, you know, the, the ongoing war, for example, and the potential for geopolitics geopolitical escalation, we need to really use this as a moment to encourage people to invest more in the future of our country, right? And unlocking the potential uh, of Americans and, and, you know, frankly, people around uh, the world. But we can use that fear as a galvanizing and positive force uh, rather than I, I think sometimes, uh, you know, fear can become a negative force that holds back that progress. And that's also something that, that I am keeping an eye on um, right now. I love that. Fear can be the enemy of progress. And there, an opportunity lies within. So, Jeffrey, if I can just bring you. So, what's your view? And sorry to put you on the spot. Perhaps, perhaps you can share an example of how you've demonstrated or witnessed best practice to ensure that underrepresented groups have been disproportionately uh, impacted. Well, I think it's the piece of um, when why set the target or the ambition if you're not going to consider it during the process of downsizing or even upscaling your business. So I think the work that I've been a part of and seen us do is kind of really lean into what's the impact of the decisions that we're making? How does it impact the business? How does it impact our kind of aspirations around the markets that we're trying to get into? And how do we retain the right people to stay in those roles? So I think it's been that more piece of really galvanizing everyone and bringing together the right team. So working with the talent team and our kind of leadership to really look at who we're connecting with and Doing it that way has enabled us to retain people, but also to kind of think about the communities that kind of build into. So to Evan's piece, around the innovation and how does that show up for us? Um, and it's that kind of unawkward or weird moment where you're having the conversation and you're trying to get everyone to understand that actually by reducing, you're kind of changing the structure of the organization and that from a DNI standpoint, we really need to make sure that we're kind of leaning outside of our bubbles. We all live within a community and sometimes that kind of locks us into a box and we have to break out of that box to really understand where are we trying to go, what networks are we trying to collectively lean into and how do we do that. So I think at Burberry we're kind of really aligned to that, but it's that piece of throughout the years I've kind of always driven that message and I think that's how I've seen the, I guess, the evolution and the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. Look, I'm going to move us on because we've got a ton of questions coming in. So. Uh, one around the at report um, and inclusive leadership. So the at report is really clear um, around the need to model inclusive leadership, but um, the questionnaire asks, many argue that there's a say-do gap, i.e. advocates often comment that corporate leaders in the C-suite exhibit the same -ish sorts of behaviours um, as one another, then ultimately end up hiring uh, people and look and feel like themselves. So, and the attributes that are quoted here are things like being confident, super calm, being extroverted, thinking on the spot, and so on. So, Evan, if I can start with you, have you given any thought to the behavioural traits that might be missing in your leadership team? And I'm, I'm not referring to visible difference. I think the questionnaire wants to know more about uh, uh, diversifying a team with people that might be neurodiverse or indeed lack those traits of uber confidence that I've just um, referred to. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think, um, 
really what great leadership represents for us is the ability to unlock the potential of your team, right? Uh, you know, and, and that's why we talk a lot about service-based leadership at, at Snap, because you know, ultimately, as you become a leader, you're assessed really on the performance of your team, right? You're no longer an individual contributor, and it's much more about the way that that uh, you serve your team to achieve, you know, your your bigger uh, goals, and so. I think that requires leaders who can adapt to bring out the best in all sorts of different people. Oftentimes I see you know, new uh, leaders, for example, not adapting their own leadership style enough, not realizing that you know, being a leader means in many ways being a chameleon, right? Because you need to you know, relate to all the different people who you serve in different ways to unlock you know, their, their own personal development and growth. And so we really look at leaders that are you know, not only diverse you know, in terms of their background, the way that they're thinking, but also highly adaptable because that adaptability is what enables them to bring out the best in so many uh, different people. But I also think in addition to that, we have to maintain that high bar that you know, as a leader, you do have to be able to communicate with your team. You do have to be able to inspire your team, but we acknowledge that people do that in all sorts of different Ways and and so I think um, you know as long as long as we can continue to hold that high bar in terms of what great leadership looks like, but then recognize not only that leaders have to adapt and be flexible, um, you know, but but also uh, that that leaders you know can achieve those goals in, in very different ways and and deliver those uh, results in very different ways. I think is is critically important. So Ori, if I could turn to you, so we've just heard there the importance of unlocking potential. Uh, we've heard about setting a, a high bar. Um, just taking a slightly different angle, how often do you think these traits that get in the way of those things happening, i.e. anxiety, introversion, shyness, and so on, are barriers to success and becoming an integrated part of a leadership team? All the time. I mean, I wish that more institutions were like SNAP, where those kinds of conversations are happening, but where we are today as a society and I'll be honest, I'm a communicator, right? So I've made an entire career of actually helping CEOs and other leaders exhibit same-ish behaviors. Um, you know, we're retained to help train, you know, meet, you know, people for media engagements or speaking engagements, and we we tell them what best practice is. The entire foundation of calling a communication style best practice is problematic. And so, first of all, so happy to be in-house now because I'm not on the consulting side where I'm I'm guilty of this, but you know, for real, I do think that the way we view leadership as society is can be very exclusionary to people, particularly those with disabilities. It's very rare to see, you know, deaf or hard of hearing CEOs or individuals that may have other brilliant skills, but maybe are shy or on, you know, have autism spectrum disorder, really thriving in public forums. And I think that's particularly acute right now as we're in midterm elections. Um, you know, nothing's been the same since JFK did the very first televised debate. It became about what you look like, how you communicate, um, how you can sway others. Uh, so, you know, if we're going to really have more challenging discussions about what it means to influence and inspire, I think a lot of institutions need to start replicating what Evan's talking about, which is looking at how you empower your team rather than the leader as the individual contributor or the figurehead, because I think that can really be a big barrier to entry to people who bring all kinds of magic to the table. Love that. And look, if I can just share a quick personal reflection, when we do find the mechanisms for those very people that you're referring to, and we provide a fair chance for them to contribute, no one, absolutely no one suffers a detriment, except probably those who've had it easy uh, all their careers. And I'm always a fan of potential uh, rather um, than polish. So look, um, let's move on. Audience, please do continue to put questions in the chat. We're going to have some time uh, to get to more of them. Uh, shortly. So the next question, again, is around the app report, and it suggested uh, one way to model and incentivize inclusive leadership is by increasing your personal DEI expertise. And I think an incredible way to do this is by recognizing that being open, fallible, and vulnerable is actually a strength, not a weakness. But it is something that many struggle to do because there are corporate environments that still make some feel that it's like a weakness. So, Jeffrey, if I can just turn to you, what are your thoughts? And if you're comfortable sharing an example of either when you've witnessed or indeed personally felt that you've been able to be open and fallible with your teams and what impact did it have? So I think 
it, this is such an important thing. I think, you know, DE&I is about the human condition. It's about your culture of your organization. And I think it's about the consideration in the ways that you help drive the bottom line, but also create a caring and open environment, which sometimes feels a bit disconnected. And I think for me, what I've seen over the years is when leaders have lent into being open and authentic, they've had the better results. They've been able to develop teams that have trust and respect. And I think, you know, an example I can give as a CEO that I worked for, where we started to do some work around race and identity in the organization around 2012. And he stood up publicly on a platform and said, look, this is something that I've never had to consider. I was raised in a family where we didn't talk about race. We didn't talk about that kind of difference. So the things that I'm hearing from my people, the things that I'm hearing from the organizations that we're partnering with is making me really uncomfortable, but I'm willing to be in this space and be in this room and own that uncomfortability. And I encourage the rest of my peers, I encourage those that report into me to do the same thing. And I think what that set for the culture within the organization was that everyone then started to ask questions and started to unpack what they'd been taught and what they'd learned because he kind of role modeled what we wanted to achieve. So I think it's finding those moments. I think for me personally, I'm dyslexic. So I have sent very awful emails to people and I've had to say to them, you know something, I'm not always great with spelling or grammar. And if it doesn't make sense, please reach out. And just being open in that way has then encouraged others to show up and speak as well. So I think that's the challenge. They everyone assumes you get to a senior leadership level by doing certain things and you know your skills are not the, the thing that got you there. It's the way you show up or the things that you say. And I think it's that piece of uncovering that and shining a light on it's your vulnerabilities and the challenges that you face to get to the seat that you sit in. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. And look, and, and my experience too, as soon as you have leaders stand up and talk about whatever it is that they're dealing with, it always inspires a whole generation of people who work for them. And again, very little downside for doing so. I've got a couple more questions and I have got questions in on the chat. Sorry, I happened to look at two screens at the same time. So th this first question is on um, return on investment. And I like this because uh, it's a technical question. If you don't mind, Evan, I'm going to direct this uh, to you. So the questioner wants to know, Whilst um, any company can make commitments, there are some that are just not bought into DNI, and some of those leaders are likely to be far more incentivized if they see tangible a return on investment for the company's DEI efforts. So, how important do you feel it is to provide a clear ROI measurement for DNI teams to be successful in their in their jobs? Well, measurement's definitely uh, important, and, and I think what people are, are realizing beyond, you know, the importance to innovation, for example, that I mentioned earlier, is that if you really want to serve a global community, right, DEI is absolutely central uh, to product development, to being able uh, to create a product that resonates with people around the world, and that's one of the challenges that, that we're constantly, uh, you know, trying to tackle, building a product that's relevant for someone in India and Japan and, you know, uh, Southeast Asia and the United States is, is is really challenging and one of the best ways to do that uh, is to work with a team that's really diverse and also is able to empathize with people who come from you know different backgrounds or live in different places or are situated you know socioeconomically in different ways and, and that really informs our product development process which overall expands you know our, our market opportunity and so i think you know in, in terms of measuring of course uh the the return on investment with with dei there there are uh, plenty of studies that that go deep uh, you know on the impact of, of dei in, in the workplace but i also think it's just critical to expanding overall long-term business opportunity and, and more and more leaders uh, i believe are, are aware of that as they're trying to you know engage more customers and Jeffrey, if I can just uh, ask you to follow up, have you ever seen any DEI initiatives at Burberry or indeed any other companies that you've found to be really good examples uh, of uh, an ROI? Yeah, I think I've seen you know a number of examples been doing this for a while now. And I think it's that piece of sometimes discussing difference has kind of led to a shift in, in representation across all levels and people really understanding why we're doing the work. So I think one of the organizations I worked for from having those discussions and setting some ambitions, we went from being like 13% women in leadership to about 40% at my time of departure. I think changing policies and being really public about those shift in the policies and why you're doing it, create a lot of visibility for the, those living in, within the LGBT plus community and kind of giving them the, the voice to know that the organization cared and 
understood their needs. And then I think also using our DNI agenda to really drive customer and consumer engagement. I think a lot of the time, you know, we kind of always think, oh, we have to put some hard numbers behind this. But some of it's relational and kind of having those relationships and being able to go out into the community and have authentic um, engagement is also key. So I think that for me is always the return on investment that I speak to with the leaders that I partner with and also how I design the strategies that I put in place. Can I just probe you slightly? So could you just talk just slightly more just about how then you've used DEI as a differentiator to drive greater business value for Burberry? Um, so for Burberry, it's that piece of the relationships that we're building. So I'm actually in New York at the moment, as you know, Arun, and I'm here to do a session with one of our clients around the LGBT community and how we can reach out and do more than just say, put in the policies in the working environment, but actually go into the communities and give a voice to those that don't always have a seat at the corporate table. So we're partnering with a number of charities to really help us kind of drive into that. And I think that's the kind of critical thing because as RL said earlier on, is that piece of, yes, we look at it from a human uh, HR standpoint, but it's also that piece of how do we go into the community? How do we amplify those communities and give them a, opportunity to kind of spin their narrative and explain what they're trying to achieve. And that's fundamental to the shifts that we see. So when we look at, you know, the kind of conversation around marriage equality, that was driven by corporations, that wasn't driven by our politicians. So those are the moments where corporations are actually leaning into changing culture, changing society. And that's how I see DNI playing a big part on the returning investment. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeffrey. I'm going to take one more question, then I must go to the Q and A's. And yeah, do forgive me, my eyes moving around uh, a lot. So this is a very short question, but uh, one that I like enormously. And I'll direct this to you, uh, Oriel. Um, so say DEI may stifle true innovation. What do you think about that? I I don't mean to to be snarky. I'm I'm smiling because I I feel like we're dancing around the same question. You know, so the, the earlier question around, you know, is DEI alpha generating? And now we're asking about whether it's innovative. You know, at the end of the day, there is no more innovative or alpha generating way to approach your business than to include all the stakeholders that you serve in the conversation, in the boardroom, in the product innovation room, in any room that you're where it happens, right? To use a Hamilton reference. So um, if you are a company that has a diverse stakeholder audience that you serve in order to survive, the only way to survive and thrive is to have a community within your institution that deeply understands the needs of those stakeholders. It's that plain and simple. Um, but you know, as it relates to a more holistic approach to DEI that really is sophisticated, I, I will say part of the reason why people are still asking this question, why is this innovative or why is this alpha generating is because the conversations around DEI, like I said earlier, are quite one dimensional. So I don't blame people who are skeptics because we keep just talking about representation for represent representation's sake. It's not about how many black or Latinx employees you have in tech checking that box. It's about what teams are they on? Are they in roles that have the ability to influence outcomes? Do they have positions that enable them to contribute to product or other you know, particular areas and drive outcomes? Um, when we talk about people and representation, are we looking at tying executive pay to those outcomes? That's something that we need to be looking at. Are we adopting things like the NFL's Rooney rule to ensure that we're actually including a diverse candidate pool when recruiting? Um, if you're going to look at purchasing, like we talked about, when you are out there saying we want to commit to increased you know, minority-owned businesses in our supply chain, first have better metrics to actually explain that. So a lot of people group small businesses, veteran-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, and minority-owned businesses in one bucket and say, oh, we're at 11%. That's not how this works. You need to break those things out. Right now, we're actually looking at most of the Fortune 500 being at only 2% of diverse-owned business um, in their supply chain. We can do a lot better there. Um, so again, measurement, measurement, specificity, specificity. And then on philanthropy, I think it's about, you know, rather than having these sort of one-off gifts and um, sort of publicity stunts and saying, hey, we gave to the NAACP today, congratulations to ourselves, thinking about ways to create more sort of long-term partnerships, strategic partnerships with institutions that are in a position to create change and galvanizing your employee base to actually be part of that relationship. Um, and also thinking about placing executive team members 
on the boards of those institutions that matter to you. Um, so that was a, a lot. There's even more here, but I think as long as we continue to up level and sort of increase the sophistication of why DEI, the more people will be bought into this as a, an, as a practice. Um, but the fact that that question keeps being asked, I think points to what we're doing wrong on explaining it. Fabulous. Add Evan, can you, yes, please. I was just going to say as well, I think the piece of this conversation is where you need to look at DNI is that it's part of your culture. It's, it's not a subset. It's how you show up as a business. And I think sometimes the reason why we're still having these same questions and the same loop is because we always look at it as, oh, it's this additional thing that we need to do. And it's, it's meant to be fundamental to your business. So I think for you guys at Snap, that's really probably easy to articulate. But everyone else is that piece of how do you find that connection? So I think that's a fundamental thread that we have to kind of push past to get us to a good, good place of understanding. OK, so there's a lot today about this being uh, being really intentional and being a, a really integrated part of the business. So I'm going to go to some of the questions um, that have come in from uh, the floor since we've been uh, speaking. So the first question is, um, and I can ask this, I'll paraphrase, um, businesses have actively committed to being anti-racist. And my question is, how can businesses truly be anti-racist so rather than pick any of you out does anybody want to um give that a give that a stab so i can start i think to be truly anti-racist um is that piece of creating the space to educate everybody so we learn specific things about communities from school uh from life from family from friends and i think it's that piece of as an organization you can lean into transforming that understanding and giving people the space to actually learn the real history of the world that we live in and creating those moments, whether it's during Black History Month, whether it's during Pride Month, and making sure that it's intersectional and that you're actually leaning into understanding those communities. And that's how I think you kind of, you start the conversation of being anti-racist. I think it's also then in your policies and your practices and what you stand for and what you're willing to not stand on the fence for. So if something happens in your organization and you're willing to speak up and challenge it and or remove that individual for their behavior, that sends a signal to people that you're living in the space of being anti-racist. You know, those are the things that you need to yeah. do. They're not easy, but you know, that's where you start. The only thing I would add is in order to be truly anti-racist as an institution, you have to encourage and empower the majority groups so the white men in the institution to be not only allies, right, sitting on the sidelines saying we support you, but to be active participants in these discussions. So mm -hmm. I cry every time I see affinity groups created, for example, the Women's Network or the Black Employee Network, where um, they send the minority group off to speak amongst themselves without actually engaging on a regular basis. So some companies call it a sponsor. I think that's actually a bit uh, condescending. But you need to have a framework through which the white men are actually invited into the room or participating in those discussions, whether it be once a month or joining events frequently, not just saying, oh, that's the women's network event. I'm not going because that's for them. Because you're actually putting the burden back on the minority group to solve their own issues. They're really just having an echo chamber of the same conversation. So what is the reporting framework for um, majority leaders to actually understand what their concerns are, have back and forth conversations, and also get the sponsorship and the support throughout the organization um, from that group? Thank you so much. I've got two questions in. I'm, I'm, this is going to be the last one, but I'm going to tell you now so you can have a think about it. It's the, it's the one thing that you're most proud of uh, in DEI. So I'll come back to that as a, so we can end on a positive, or at least hope we can end on a positive. Um, Evan, I'm going to ask, I'm going to uh, ask this one to you. Um, how can underrepresented uh, people in the workforce gain a seat at the decision-making table? This is a. A, a great question. I, I think, uh, you know, at, at least as far as uh, SNAP is concerned, our hope is that they can gain that seat the same way as everybody else by, you know, really contri contributing meaningfully to our business. And then, you know, if we are operating our, our business in a way that's, you know, anti-racist, we're focused on equitable outcomes. And that really means that, you know, in our promotion processes and through our hiring processes, the way that we think about performance management, we create opportunities for people 
to succeed at Snap based on on their talent and abilities and their unique abilities and and of course the the insights that that they bring and so our aspiration at Snap is that people have a seat at that table uh, you know re really based on their extraordinary talent and their insights and as I mentioned diversity uh, you know really helps people approach problems in new ways which means that they can help us solve uh, help help us solve uh, problems in a way that maybe wouldn't occur. Uh, you know, as Ariel mentioned, to to a majority group, for example, especially as we think about growing our business uh, around the world. And so I think that sort of unique insight and diverse perspective is why it's so important uh, to, to have folks uh, from different backgrounds at that table. Um, but the, the reason why folks are there is because of their, you know, talent and ability to contribute. Um, and that that's just so important. Thank you, Evan. And I'm going to just direct this next one to you, uh, Ariel. Um, again, paraphrasing, it's... Um, how would you suggest that leaders, um, and this is for tech, but we can broaden it. Uh, how would you persuade people um, in the broader organization that we're in to really, really land why DNI is so important to their work, even if it's not something that they're touched by uh, day to day? Data. You asked for a uh, snippy answer. It's all about data. Um, I can't speak highly enough of the, some of the data that McKinsey puts out around how um, companies that have more diverse uh, makeups are, you know, generating more revenue than others. <laughs> um, and I think it should also be specific to your organization. So case studies of where a more intersectional approach to product innovation led to some great outcome for sales. I'm coming up with something, you know, fictional, but that is why diversity remains the responsibility of the entire C-suite, not just the chief diversity officer tucked into HR. So you would need the CFO to collaborate with the CMO, with the CEO, et cetera, to actually come up with these case studies and these stories and attach the data and the financial figures next to it. Um, so data, data, data. <laughs> Wonderful. And my apologies for not being able to interact in a conversation. I'd love to, but unfortunately, time doesn't allow me to. So we've got about three and a half minutes, one minute each. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Jeffrey. Um, uh, the thing, the one thing that you're most proud of in the world of DE and I. I think the thing I'm most proud of is the shift in the conversation. Um, as you know, Rune, I've been doing this for a number of years now. And we are actually truly talking about this subject today as a demonstration of that. And we're creating the opportunity for people to learn and reflect and, you know, find their center within the conversation as individuals, but as organizations. And I think that's been fascinating to watch evolve and change and shift. Yeah, it's been hard work, but we're getting there slowly. Yeah. Uh, and Oriel, over to you. Um, I would speak for more from a personal standpoint. I'm most proud of the fact that I joined a firm with such an important legacy as a black owned business, but I haven't rested on my laurels and have continued to push and challenge us to say, even though people expect that we're doing everything right to point out the moments where we're not and make some changes. And so a recent example of that would be, um, I helped lead the, um, the, reorganization of our diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging committee, um, because I saw some holes and I spoke up and that was really exciting and thrilling and, and scary. Great, but you've had impact as a consequence. And Evan, a final word to you. Yeah, gosh, I, I mean, I think it's hard to feel proud when we've got so much work to do, to be, to be honest. But I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things I'm optimistic about are the, are the ways that businesses are working together more than I've seen in the past. So one of the things that's so exciting about the, you know, action to catalyze uh, tech is that companies realize instead of competing with each other, you know, uh, over a relatively small pool of, of diverse, you know, engineering talent, for example, we can invest in actually increasing that pool of, of uh, talent by, of course, building a, a better pipeline. And I think that sort of willingness for businesses to work together to invest over the long term is the beginning of, you know, what I'm hopeful could be a, a bigger shift uh, towards, you know, meaningful investments that could really change the trajectory uh, of our country, but also our, our industry. So I'm optimistic that businesses are working together, uh, but what we certainly have, have a lot of work to do. And we couldn't end on a better set of words. We're in this together. So, look, what can I say? Thank you so, so much, all three of you, for your time and energy. And thank you to all the audience and for all the questions uh, that we got in. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of them, but um, I wish you all a very pleasant day. Thank you and goodbye.
Thank you. Thank you.